introduce our next speaker. Uh, we have Christian Angermeyer. Before founding Atai Life Sciences to address the mental health care crisis, Christian co-founded Ribopharma, which merged with US peer uh, Al Nilam in 2003 and subsequently went public. Since then, Christian has created, co-founded, and invested in numerous successful companies, has raised approximately $2 billion for his portfolio companies, and has been involved in more than 40 successful IPO and M&A transactions, either as an entrepreneur, investor, banker, or advisor. He'll have two uh, reporters joining him as well. Uh, so thank you for joining us, Christian, and uh, welcome to the stage. Okay, wait, and the video. Okay, I should be seen. Hello, everybody. Um, at least I can see myself. Um, and I should be also be able to be heard um, if I get feedback. Um, if not, I make a monologue. Uh, oh, hello, hi, Amanda. Christian. Hi, hi. I was Good morning. I was to do a monologue. <laughs> like, <laughs> And some, Definitely uh, not. Here some comes Suzanne. Suzanne. Oh, hello, Suzanne. Well, good morning. It's great to be here. I guess it's not morning for you, though. It's afternoon. I'm in London. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, morning, well, we're looking. Afternoon. We're excited to chat with you. Uh, a little bit a different input from two journalists from Bloomberg here, uh, because our newsroom was built to follow the money, and we've been following you oh, because. My God. You've made some, um, and your introduction mentioned that you've been a uh, venture capitalist, a lot of focus on biotech um, and financial services. And yet at the same time, although some people think that these two things don't go together, we hear a lot that people who make money and earn influence and, and relationships over their experience and career want to make a difference. And I go there because I think that having spoken to you before, very much your involvement in this space of psychedelics is about making a difference to help people with depression, PTSD, um, with the mental health crisis in the world in general, which coronavirus has exacerbated. So I think that's where you are, are at, but I, I know we talked about starting with your biography and we could start with your boyhood, happy boyhood in Bavaria. Um, but I just, I think it would be appropriate if we start with what happened about seven years ago when you took your first venture um, into an experience that was guided um, and that you have called the single most meaningful thing in your life and after you called your parents and told them you love them. Um, and yes. what about that experience um, guides you in making these investments um, in psychedelics? Okay, and please, let's, please come back to the question with capitalism because I know that a lot of people especially in the psychedelic community, see it as sort of an antithesis that somebody wants to make money with psychedelic investments and wants to do good. So I would love to come back to that then after my sort of story, because I don't see an, an antithesis um, at all to that. But, like, um, but I'm always happy to take the discussion, yeah, because I think it's an important discussion because I want the rest of the community to feel comfortable with what we're doing and to understand at least what we're doing. So, but like to my own experience, like, and I saw briefly my, uh, or our pre-speaker, um, uh, the lady who said she had depression or whatever. So I had the big luck that sort of my psychedelic uh, sort of encounter or my first psychedelic experience was not at all because I had any sort of uh, need or depression. It was sort of, I sort of posi very positively slided into that. I, a year actually before that, I had a, an evening dinner, sort of a surprise encounter with a, with a very famous scientist who sort of, and I sort of was always very anti-drugs, not in the form that they should be legal or whatever, just for myself. So I decided for myself in my youth, uh, no alcohol, no cigarettes, no other drugs. And I really stick to it. So since I have never drank alcohol ever so far, although I grew up in Bavaria. Anyway, so and this guy made me interested in psychedelics. That's the short version. Um, and then it took a year and I read a lot of the research which was done in the 60s um, by Hoffman and others. And so I had sort of, said, let's say, a medium knowledge about it. And then I was indeed in the Caribbean 
Yeah, so I always have to add in a place where it's legal with friends who were experienced with, uh, in that case, psilocybin, so magic mushrooms. Yeah, and who did my first sort of guided uh, trip. And uh, as you summarized it, it was like the single most meaningful thing I've ever done. Yeah, full stop. So nothing comes close to it. And even among, and I did it more often since then, it's a little bit maybe like with the first love, your first trip sort of stays very special for you. Um, and and I, I indeed, I literally, I know it's cheesy, uh, to, but you just mentioned it like the next, uh, the next day, yeah, because sort of I fell asleep then after day, but like the next day I called my parents, yeah, with whom I have a great relationship anyway. Yeah, um, but I realized, and again, by the way, one thing of trips is that a lot of things, especially when you become personal and talk about it, it sounds so, so uh, obvious or so banal, yeah, um, but, it's so, but it's not, and, and if I always say, I, I want to add, like, I could say, like, you could say that, oh, whatever you tell me now, you could read that in any sort of self-help book or whatever, but the, it's not actually just about the realization you have in a trip, but like the sort of intensity or the absoluteness you realize that what you realize as absolute truth. So well, if I would tell you now, hey, call your mom every day, say you love her, sort of cherish her, whatever, you would say, well, obviously, but then you don't do it because then it gets lost in the daily busyness. Yeah, while it hit me so strong that practically, because I'm an only child and it was all about my sort of uh, fears also of losing my parents somewhere, which is sort of the natural um, way of life, yeah, because they're older than me. You know? So, but like, so, but like the positive conclusion was like, cherish them while you have them, but really show it to them. Yeah. Call them, spend meaningful time with them. So again, very simple. Yeah. Or very banal, but like it, it stuck with me. So by the way, my mom, four weeks later, I did never tell her or did not tell her that I had done magic mushrooms. And four weeks later, after my holiday, she was like, something did happen in that holiday because you're like more considerate, I think you would say in English, more paying attention anyway. So that was the one thing. And then the other thought on that same day was though, because I am an entrepreneur by heart, yeah, um, I believe in entrepreneurship, was like, if it has such a profound effect on me, yeah, uh, and if it's adding so much to my life, and to my sort of mental state, which is anyway was already pretty happy, how big must the difference be for somebody who has depression or any other form of mental illness? Yeah, how positive is for such a person that sort of elevation um, level? Yeah, and it should be available actually for those people who need it, not just for people like me who can do it and want to do it and have their own impetus. And that was sort of the start to thinking, how can we bring it back really as a medication? Because this, this is it for people who really need it. How can we bring it back as a medication yeah, uh, into sort of the legal real? Yeah, and that was sort of the start of my whole psychedelic endeavor. So I'm going to pass it on to Suzanne in, in it, after this one question, but just briefly describe how you built a tie to with all the knowledge you have as an entrepreneur and a, as a and a businessman in the capitalist system. Um, how did you build a tie to actually push through um, seven or more uh, psychedelic based drugs um, that might you know be able to be in use yeah, yeah. under guided circumstances. So I think what's important is that I was not by all means at all the first person who had this idea. Yeah. So I think, and I believe I have a spiritual side. It's my personal belief, nothing to do with a tie. We always try to sort of say a tie is a professional company. I have my own sort of personal spiritual belief, but I believe in destiny. So I think it was the right moment at the right time because around about that time, yeah, you would say in English, maybe the stars aligned because there were so many sort of the FDA sort of started to change their view on these drugs. Society started to change the view first on cannabis. It was actually back then it was the cannabis way, but although like cannabis and psychedelics don't have to do like as a drug, they're not similar at all. Yeah. But like the sort of society view on it, that you have a drug, which once was sort of 
um, uh, illegal, then was able to be brought back into the legal realm. What happened with cannabis, that sort of paved the way and for psychedelics and sort of a um, perception way. So there were many things which were sort of the right time when I did it. Yeah, but I, I want to make clear that so practically I had luck, yeah, uh, but the, the, that it was the right time, but there were decades long research done by, by super amazing, important people. And if you're in a bigger context, you could even say we have a, a several thousand year old history in a shamanistic tradition with these drugs. So, so what my view on, on, on the entrepreneurship was that it's, I don't need to reinvent the wheel um, in terms of sort of science, whatever. I need to help the people or the science which is there to, to make a commercial breakthrough. So a lot of sort of drugs, individual drugs like psilocybin, arketamine, what we have, ibogaine, were attached to certain people and scientists, whatever. So, but because those scientists had to be, had been for, because of all the wrong reasons, practically, how you say, outcasts, or I would like, it was a fringe science, yeah? and they never thought about that this could ever become sort of commercial again. Yeah, they had not the experience how to build a commercial business around. So we met over the last seven years, uh, a lot of incredible people, like the founders of Compass, uh, like, um, um, uh, like the, the, the team who does Ibogaine, yeah, Deborah Mesh and her team, like, and we offer them and said, look, we have the entrepreneurship know-how, we have the funding know-how, we know how to get drugs approved because biotech in general is one of my main uh, sort of sectors I invest in. So we have all that know-how, you have the know-how around your drug, let's partner up yeah, uh, and let's make it successful. So this is the structure of a tie, it's like a platform where we have a lot of centralized functions, fundraising, finance, um, especially also the entire sort of legal, uh, patent is, is extremely important, although I know it's very controversial, but it is very important for biotech. Um, uh, the whole approval uh, process, how to deal with FDA, whatever. And then we have the scientists who take care of their individual drug, practically underneath or below or as a structure, like a holding with subsidiaries. Great, can thank you. you. Uh, hey, hey, Christian. Um, can you talk a little bit more about um, your investment in Compass Pathways? and you know, why you chose that. Yep, and by the way, just one, how, so you reading the questions, right? Because I see questions popping up, but I think it's, I can't read it all. Like, so you reading questions, I just can't We're you, right? making it up, Christian. There's no, <laughs> <laughs> but no yeah, we'll I'm seeing them. questions. Are you seeing the questions or are they just uh, coming to me? I, uh, I not. We'll take a look at them. We'll definitely take a look There's at them. There's a chat we'll function. To... Yes. I'll put it up, but... Um. Okay, you're reading them. So I'm, okay. so I'm just seeing these pop-ups coming in. So, um, um, so, so sorry, the question again for Compass. How oh, the you... Compass. I just wondered, sort of, I, wish, I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about um, why you chose Compass Pathways as an investment. Technically, well, uh, good question. In a positive way, sort of, we chose each other because we were, this was really like the very first, psychedelic company ever, so to say, for-profit company. So we met each other, um, George and Katya, the, the founders of Compass, um, and I, when they were sort of about to start, yeah, and uh, we sort of started Compass together. And it was, again, it was a match made in heaven because George and Katya, um, with a very personal story, um, um, which is more their story to tell, but with a very personal family story, um, came to psilocybin in their case. Yeah, that's a great example of what I just said. There are people who uh, were attached, let's call it attached to certain sort of psychedelics. And George and Katya were very attached to psilocybin because they had researched it for years um, to help their son and actually help their son very successfully. So sort of had the full, from research to uh, very tangible success. And, uh, and we're about, to sort of yeah, start a company because they had the same idea that I had. If it works for one person, we want to prove yeah, um, that it works for more and then sort of make it available um, to, um, to other people. So and we met and it was sort of clear from the first meeting that we want to do that together. 
Do you want to talk a little bit about um, the tension you mentioned before between sort of for-profit companies in this space and cap, you know, sort of capitalism being sort of an antithesis in a sense? Well, I think, and then, so the, the reason I, I understand where the people come from who, who see that as an issue, which I don't, but I understand because, because they, they have the same sort of um, view on the drugs that I have as an individual, not as a company. So I do think these drugs are in a certain way. And I'm, oh, I'm just talking slowly because I, I'm going to use some religious words. And Suzanne, we had, I think, this discussion when we met first. It's like, it's very, very hard um, to talk about psychedelic experiences without using religious terms. Yeah, because that's what you or what people usually have in some form or the other is a very strong spiritual, very positive experience. Um, the only problem with religious terms is because religions is maybe one of the most sort of controversial things of our time, that if I use a word, I might mean something different than the recipient who hears the word, if you use the word God or whatever. So, so that's why I'm always trying sort of to tiptoe and, and sort of try to be as neutral as possible, but you do have a very strong spiritual experience. Yeah, and this is why I understand why some people would say these plants have a religious connotation or, or are God-given or whatever. So I completely understand that. And I think, but nevertheless, it now comes my sort of my view on, on our world, even more actually, let's say positively, because if you think that they are good for people, what I think they are, yeah, you want as many people as possible to, to have access to them. Yeah, and sort of, if I look at, and the important point is that most people who say, oh, it's a religious drug and therefore nobody should make money with it, are those people who can afford going to Amsterdam or getting a shaman underground in San Francisco, yeah, and paying for it. But what those people, and that's my critique, my sort of friendly counter critique, is what those people don't realize is A, that most people don't have practically the money to do it, like because a shaman costs money. Like, and, uh, so yeah, traveling to another country costs money. Yeah, so that's like, yeah, and they easily say, oh, I, why can't we all do it in Mexico? Like, really? I was like, well, because 95% of people can't do it. And second, though, and that's maybe equally or even more important, we all, and most likely also all the people who are now in the webinar or whatever, yeah, we are very open to this stuff, but we are like the 1%, yeah. And if I look at my parents, they would never ever do it without a doctor. Yeah, if at all, like, yeah. And, and in general, I would say most like 95% of people don't have the impetus, by the way, and even more when they are sick. Yeah, because that's, for example, if you take depression, one of the definitions of depression is that you don't have the impetus to do anything. Yeah, so you won't do your own magic mushroom trip. So it's sort of a very entitled or, or sort of, elitist view to say, ah, oh, everybody should just do it on his own. Like, yeah. So my view is that, again, we should not sort of um, structure or adjust drug policy to the 1% to do it recreationally. Yeah. Although I don't mind if they do it and I'm completely for, for decriminalization. So nobody should go to jail. Yeah. It's, it's, but like, but in order to help the people who need it, who are depressive, who have PTSD, yeah, who have anxiety, yeah, we need to make it available in the healthcare system as an approved drug, which is paid. Hopefully, America is difficult. I know it will be common when you have a messed up healthcare system. You do have, like, but like, still there are healthcare insurers. Yeah, in Europe it's easier. Yeah, but like as often as possible, hopefully, then in the future, psychedel uh, psychedelic therapies will be paid by the insurers. Yeah, uh, and you have a doctor next to you, you trust, and da -da -da. And by the way, also side note. Yeah, I think psychedelics have amazing potential, but there is never a wonder drug. So yeah, there are also, although I think tiny risks associated, you should, you should have a doctor anyway to tell you if this or that psychedelic is the right one for you or not, or if you have any conditions why you shouldn't do it. So anyway, so you need it with a doctor, you need to get paid. And the only way, and they are very pragmatic, the only way to make a drug approved with the FDA is to raise a lot of money because drug approval can easily exceed 100, 200 million to get it through phase to all the, the various phases. Yeah. 
And let's just face it, you don't get the money if you don't give investors back the money and not just the money back, but make a return. Yeah. And my favorite example, and I, I, I super love to support him. There is one nonprofit I'm always trying to, to make marketing for is like uh, Maps. Yeah. So they tried since a very long time as a nonprofit. Yeah. Um, so their issue is they still are not fully funded. So I always say, everybody who tells me, yeah, uh, don't do it. I think, hey, why don't you give money to MAPS first? Because they have one drug. I have seven drugs. So I need to raise over the next five years, some hundred millions, yeah, which is not possible in a charity way. I actually, unfortunately, I don't have the numbers, but I made even the due diligence and checked on all the charities in the world, how much are health related. Yeah, and da, da, da. and there is not the money I need is not raised in the entire charity health space, not talking about mental health, like, which is again, a subject. It's just not possible to do it. Yeah. In a, in a nonprofit way for seven drugs. Yeah. Maps is really struggling and I appreciate everybody who wants to donate to maps and goes on the website and does it. Yeah. With one drug. Yeah. So long Christian, story short, I think, I think yeah. we have, I just, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah, I think we I have time for, for one more question before oh. we go to the Q and a period. And I just want to let you know that, um, your speaking of the accessibility was something that, um, um, got a lot of positive feedback in the, in the chat. Um, and we want to touch on, on, uh, cannabis. Um, I would say that with MAPS, you know, as a nonprofit, one of the um, aspects that it's committed to is that our healthcare system is broken. So, you know, yes, you have to be pragmatic. And I just wanted to ask, and Suzanne, please weigh in before um, we give the floor back to Christian, but there are, there's a way of speaking to the investor community, uh, to people who've invested in a tie, for example, like uh, Mike Novogratz, I, I spoke to him this week about um, racial justice um, in the wake of the death of George Floyd. And I think in some ways his involvement with blockchain and, and yours as well um, is about, you know, looking for ways to disrupt. Um, uh, MAPS itself has attracted many um, uh, investors from the f finance world um, who are used to the discipline, but I'm interested in how you talk to them about this opportunity mm -hmm. um, in a way that might be different from, you know, the longer standing community does. And Suzanne, maybe you just want to add to that. No, I think, I think you said it all. I'm interested in sort of the, the, the VC um, interest in this space and how you speak to them about it. Okay, maybe one, one side note, I just want to want to comment on that because I, it's, it's really a good example. So, so I think we all agree, and, and Mike, on, on, on the George Floyd issue and the police issues, whatever, meaning I don't want to actually, I would say, pontificate as a European because Europe has its own problems, but America has some issues, yeah? And uh, police system is one, and the healthcare system is another one, yeah? So I'm just thinking, first of all, you can't take on all the challenges at once, yeah? And I don't want to call it the mistake because it was sort of done with good intention, but maybe let's call it the mistake of Timothy Leary back then was that he wanted to change the system at the same time he wanted to help people, patients, yeah? And it completely backfired, yeah? So my view is I would be more than happy if America sees a healthcare reform, which you need, yeah, from my point of view. Like, I would be more than happy to see other reforms happening. But while that is ongoing and hopefully happening, it, it would be not fair to withhold um, the drugs which help really hundreds of millions of people who need it now. Yeah. So and, and as I'm, and I think it's, again, it's very entitled, it would be very arrogant to say, look, you know what, depressive person? Yeah. Uh, the system is not right. This is why you have to wait the next 10 years and hopefully you're not killing yourself till the system is right. I'm like, hey, let's get it done in the system we have, which is not perfect, yeah? And in parallel, let's hope that the system improve. I would be all for it, yeah? So talking to, um, talking to investors, um, all of the investors, I have to say very positively, from Mike to Peter Thiel um, to, to Tor, um, they are super committed because, again, both actually, like, they know that it's a great uh, um, um, business endeavor, yeah. Uh, but also at the same time, but that's almost true for biotech, by the way. I don't wanna pretend that we are more special than other biotech companies. I do have to say I have that for all of my biotech companies that 
investors are happy that you, in biotech, you always do something good at the same time you make money. Any drug which is approved is good for humanity. If I have a drug against cancer, it's good for people. Like, I don't know, I just don't want to say, oh, we're overly special. Yeah, uh, meaning we are great and any other biotech company is great. So this is why I always wish, this is the great thing in biotech, there is no competition. I always wish everybody else success because you might need it yourself, yeah. So, so it's, but they, I can say all of my investors are in because they see that we can change the world. You can add, again, I just don't want to be too sort of, uh, yeah, complimenting ourselves, but I think you have this sort of sub layer that on the one side, you, you, you help people with mental health illnesses, yeah? And then one layer above, I think we all have the feeling that even beyond an individual illness, the world needs psychedelics, yeah? So I would, for example, again, but I, I know it's, it's, I know, and I, and it's just, I try to do it as, and I wanna say something positive, but as careful as I can, because I'm white and I'm a European, so I have no clue of, or clue is the wrong word, I mean, I, the, I think the American history with what's happening now is so complex, yeah? And I think it's hard for Americans to fully understand it, even harder for Europeans, yeah? But I think there is definitely a lot of trauma involved and pain, which goes beyond an individual event. So there is a lot of, and we know, by the way, there is very good research, pain can be structurally, can be even given genetically and trauma, yeah, from one generation to the next, yeah? And I have amazing, um, um, I don't know if I can say it now because it's a MAPS thing and I don't want to spoil their, their thing, but MAPS is releasing a book on a, it's a, again, I don't know, always is obviously it's like you're talking about one individual and then extrapolating it, but like MAPS has an amazing story of a, of a, of a Holocaust boy who's now obviously very old, yeah, um, but his life story and how he had these deeply, um, um, I would say in, entrenched trauma in his life and although he became very successful he always had this underlying pain and trauma and how actually later in his life that helped him or he was helped by an ayahuasca ceremony so dmt yeah so and that is i think i had i, had, I was actually thinking about that story often in terms of this racial injustice because i think there is so much trauma and pain involved and i think psychedelics beyond a disease or beyond the mental illness could really help our entire society. And I think that's the special part of a tie which a lot of uh, my investors and myself are seeing. Thank you. I will um, open the floor for, for questions from our conference organizers. Hey, thank you both so much for uh, coming on. And um, yeah, we really, we really appreciate the dialogue. I think it's, um, a dialogue that a lot of people are really curious about, uh, just you know, seeing how does capitalism, how do these larger systems interact with psychedelics, um, and all of the other points that you mentioned as well. Uh, have uh, you know a couple different questions? Unfortunately, we're running low on time, but the few things that I wanted to ask about was uh, first off, you know, uh, as you know, uh, kind of putting my tabula rasa, you know, organization hat, you know, you have this nice split of a tie and then yourself. Um, you know, for us, we're also looking at, you know, above ground companies, companies that can really allow for the PAP process to be able to um, permeate society in a really accessible way, um, especially for those who need it most. Uh, at the same time, we're doing a lot of research and in investigating what the recreational market looks like as it continues to, to grow. Um, we've had, you know, dozens of dispensaries open up just in the last few months uh, that are, you know, working underground, providing these compounds to people uh, illicitly, you know, throughout Canada, throughout the U.S., and, uh, you know, from the research that we've done, there's going to be a talk on it later on the conference. Um, we've seen that, you know, many cannabis dispensaries, a third of their entire um, portfolio now in terms of the product they're pushing is actually, uh, you know, mushrooms, dried mushrooms. Um, so it's changing very quickly. A lot of people are getting access to these compounds in more informal settings. I'm wondering, you know, what is the role of, you know, organizations like our own that are focused more on the above ground market to also be able to introduce harm reduction and other sort of, um, you know, other sort of either integration practices or uh, media or whatever it might be to be able to help individuals who are accessing these compounds underground still in an accessible way to have the healthiest experience possible with them. Yeah, the problem is, I, I don't know if I have a, a sort of satisfying answer because 
I, I really do think that those drugs should not be legal in a commercial way. Again, and for all the viewers, like, so you have, the, the one thing is like, they can be legal as a medication with a doctor. The other thing, what you were describing would be that someone, they would be legal, legal in terms of free sellable like cannabis, yeah. And then the middle ground, by the way, is decriminalization. That means if you grow it yourself and you get caught with it in your car, you're not going to jail because it's not criminal to own it, but you're not allowed to make a business out of it. Yeah. So I am pro decriminalization because yeah, um, nobody should need to go to Amsterdam or to, to Mexico if he wants to do it himself and he has a strong feeling. I'm very, very worried about the, the sort of open selling it and what, yeah, um, and, and a f sort of commercially for, for really one important reason. These are extremely, in a very positive meaning when they use right, extremely powerful drugs yeah um and first of all yeah because they're so powerful yeah there can be side effects they are not permanent yeah but for example you can have a psychotic episode yeah and um and i have seen people like with psychotic episodes and it's not fun you need a doctor next to them who stops that yeah so and if that happens at home and then the problem is in the moment you sell it you would say, yes, but I want people to use it with a shaman, whatever, yeah? But like, in the moment you make it too easy, people might use it alone, yeah? And that's then the moment when they could have an accident or even do something very, very bad to themselves, yeah? In such a moment. And, and that would actually harm the entire few of the whole category, yeah? Um, without any sort of big benefit, because now comes the second point, yeah? And again, I'm, the one thing is like, these sort of recreational stuff, but I think, that is what I almost think is egoistic if people push that because it is for the one or two percent who want to have fun. Yeah. Uh, but like, again, we're talking here about 360 million people and that's the official number. Yeah. Most likely more people have depression. Yeah. They need it for them. This might be the one and only solution to have a good life. Yeah. So first of all, if we're doing it too loosely, I, or ever would do it because of our thanks God, like, this would actually risk the endeavor. That's my worry. But second, yeah, uh, even if you say, oh, maybe they could do that, you might need a guide, even if you don't think it, because everybody from us has sort of trauma. Maybe not a huge one, yeah, but like everybody of us has pain. Everybody of us has been, has been hurt in his, in his or her life, yeah. And it might be a trip, you might have five great trips alone, but there might be this one trip. And I, by the way, I had very, very dark, very, very helpful trips, but they were good at the end. Actually, my, I don't like the word bad trip because a bad trip, if you turn it or use it correctly, it's a challenging, but then very, very good trip. But because I had great guides next to me in that moment, yeah. Um, and again, even if nothing dramatic happened, like somebody killing him or herself, it could still really negatively affect your mental health if you don't have the right people around. Again, this is why, sorry for the long answer, but I think it's really important that we make clear with all the enthusiasm we all have, yeah? And we've, so these, they are way more powerful than, um, uh, than cannabis or whatever. And let me, one last sentence. This is by, by the way, the reason they have never been used as party drugs in the history of humanity. It were almost, and I almost, I would like to go around with you. I think I can't go away here from the computer, but like, because I am collecting ancient um, uh, uh, statues of gods and goddesses who were directly connected with, uh, with uh, psychedelics. But that shows us these were always ritualistic drugs, always, yeah? Always with shamans, priests, or however you call them. And it should stay that way. It should stay in a, in a actually very orderly, yeah, organized ritualistic way, which in our days will be a therapeutic way with a doctor. Mm -hmm, definitely. Well, thank you so much, Christian. I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Amanda and Suzanne for coming on. Um, we will talk to you all soon. And uh, yeah, be well. Great pleasure. Thank you very much. See you soon. Bye bye. When I can Take care. Again. Yeah. Bye.